The following is a presentation of Surprise Church. El siguiente programa es la presentación de la iglesia Surprise. Last week, here's where we left off. We started the book of Acts, and we left off challenging ourselves to not be baby birds. Jesus rises from the dead, and then he comes and tells his disciples that he's not actually going to stick around, and he floats up to heaven after telling them that he wants them to go into the world and do big things, and they find themselves staring up into heaven like this, so the God, we said, actually has to send an angel down and say, uh, stop doing that, okay? I want you to go and make a difference in the world, not just stare upwards, and we talked about how a tendency that we have, in the very same way, it to always be looking upwards to someone else to do something rather than take initiative for God, always be looking upwards for a pastor or an elder or a mentor or a teacher or a coach or someone else to kind of lead the way when God calls us to make a difference. And so God calls us to grow, always being childlike in our faith, but not staying childish in our faith so that we learn how to feed ourselves. We learn how to pray and read scripture ourselves. We learn how to share the gospel and lead other people to Christ ourselves. We learn how to kind of take the mantle of what it means to be a Christ follower and go into the world and make a difference in our lives and workplaces and homes rather than just always stay baby birds. We start as baby birds. Everybody starts as babies. We talked about how important it is for us to grow into maturity and what that looks like. Uh, the, 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 the trajectory goes like this. Jesus said, I want you to start as one missional community, and, and I want that missional community to, to bless Jerusalem, Judea, Sumeria, to the ends of the earth, to, to bless the local community, the regional community, and the ends of the earth. And the, the formula on top is kind of how it, it looks. It looks like Jesus goes to heaven and, and, and sends us into the world. But he goes, and then he promises the day he's going to come back. Those are the bookends of the age we're in right now. We're in an age where Jesus has ascended, and then he promises to return. And in the middle there, what the book of Acts teaches us is that the Spirit comes and we go. Jesus comes and goes, but we are in the age right now where the Spirit has come and we go. And we're, we're watching that process now over the first couple chapters of the book of Acts unfold. See, a lot of uh, Christians get the order wrong. They are, they're just so focused on Jesus coming back that they're, they're, they stay baby birds just waiting for the return. And and Jesus is going to come and punish the angry or the, the bad world, and we're just angry Christians. And, and others just forget that the Spirit has come, so that they go into the world and just kind of just kind of do what they think is best without really relying on and leaning on God's power. God says, "Get the order right. I have ascended, and I will come again. And the Spirit has come, and your job is to figure out how to go for me." So we're going to unpack that a little bit today. But uh, the, the, one of the main reasons the disciples were staring up like baby birds, one of the main reasons that they were struggling to figure out how to go forward was because when they thought about the last three years of following Jesus, they hit a wall. And that wall was standing between them moving forward for the kingdom. The, the, the wall was standing between them and the mission that Jesus gave them in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that wall was named Judas. Now, the name Judas, I would bet that 99.9% .9 of the population could at least tell you a little bit about him. He betrayed Jesus. And the name has become synonymous with, with a rat, a betrayer. And it wasn't, though, so much that he betrayed Jesus that bothers them. Jesus had just told them that he wants them, without him there, physically as he has been, to go and do all these great things, even greater things than he had done. And yet when they thought of Judas, someone who had walked with Jesus for three years and while Jesus was still physically here, turned his back on him, they asked themselves this question, how could God let that happen? And if it happened to Judas, why would we hope to do any better? If Judas failed in his own way, wouldn't it be wise to assume that each of one of us are going to fail in our own way? Wouldn't it be wise to assume that the idea of actually representing God physically in the world is a joke? If it happened to Judas, if Ju someone could spend that much time with Jesus, how are we going to help people who've never met him, who never walked with him, who've never sat and listened to him teach, who never ate meals with him, who didn't sleep beside him in the desert as they walked around and listened to him teach all day and watched him do miracles all day. How are we ever going to help people follow him if Judas couldn't cut it? What hope is there for any of us? 
It's a question we all probably could ask as well. When we have looked in the mirror, unless we're just completely deluded, we have looked into the eyes of a person who was so messed up that Jesus had to die for them, who has so many demons and issues in our past life story that continue to shape us as the doubtful, fearful person we are. This is a wall for us too. How in the world, <laughs> with what I have done, with, with my weaknesses, with my flaws, how in the world am I supposed to represent God to the world? Or maybe you, you have a very specific event going on right now or in your past where you just look back at that event and say, how could you let that happen to me? And if you let that happen to me then, how can I trust you going forward? You promise all these great things and I'm supposed to tell people how great you are and yet you let that happen in my life. Am I supposed to trust you? I mean, if you look at the statistics for how many people have, been, have faced abuse, for how many people struggle with addiction, for how many people struggle with pornography, for how many people have a terrible relationship with, with one or both of their parents, and God let that happen, that introduces a wall. And it's a lot to step over that wall and represent that God in the world. That's where the disciples were at. And yet, <clears throat> each one of these disciples knew this story very, very well, the story of I Israel and the Red Sea. Before Israel settled the land that Jesus talked about going into with his name, they were slaves in Egypt. They were in bondage to Pharaoh. Moses came down there, sang the song, Let My People Go, you know the story. And they get out of bondage. God saves them miraculously. They get to the Red Sea, and they're standing on the banks of the Red Sea. And then Pharaoh had a change of heart. His, God made his hard, heart hard again. And so he decides, you know what? I'm actually not going to let them go. So he gets his army and starts going after them in chariots. He's just going to obliterate them there in the desert. And they're looking at the Red Sea in front of them, and they're looking at an army behind them. And they look up, and they're like, how could you let this happen? They look at Moses. How could you let this happen? We could have died in, in Egypt. We, 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 why did we need to come out here and die? We were happier being slaves than being haunted by an, an army in the desert. They hit a wall, and it was a physical wall. It was a body of water that they could not go past. And Moses cries out to God and says, just, just, we, we need you. What are we going to do here? This is, this is God's answer. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. You see, as I talk to people, I tell them something that I often forget, and that is we have a God who raises dead people and who parts seas. And if that's the case, then any equation we could import into our relationship with him about why we can't do what he says we can do is ridiculous. I was talking to my... Uh, son about a kid that was a little rough with him at school. And of course, as a dad, when someone's rough with your kid, you just want to just, just go light him up, right? I'm saying, me and this eight-year-old, we're just going to go at it. And I told him, I'm like, hey, you want me to come to school with you tomorrow? And I'm just ready to go. I'm going to bring my brass knuckles and my kid's nunchucks, and we're going to make it happen. And they're plastic and fluorescent, but they have an effect anyway. And so I, I, I'm just like, what do we, what do we? And, he, and he looks at me and says, dad, he's tougher than you. I'm like, oh, you did not say that. Now it's really on. <laughs> Sometimes we look at God and say, God, this situation at work is tougher than you. This marriage conflict that I'm in right now, it's, it's, it's bigger than you. My anxiety or my medical problem is, is it's more powerful than you. We don't say that consciously, but somewhere back deep in here, that is what is holding us back. We're standing on the bank of the Red Sea. We're standing there looking at the story of Judas. We're standing there looking at the failure or the, the problem in our own life, and we create this equation where God is a mini-God. He's, he's miniature. He's weak. He's impotent, and, and we fail to see who he is, what he can do, and what he's done before. That's what fear does to you, by the way. It makes the past look glorious. 
It makes the last relationship you were in look better than the relationship you're in now. It makes your youth look better than your current time. It makes college look like the best time in your life and the present look like a loss. It makes something that happened in the past, the last job, the last relationship, the last uh, uh, situation you had in the, of living arrangement, roommate, it makes it just feel like the glory days. When, if you're honest, there were challenges then too. Israel would rather have gone back into slavery because they said there's, there's food to eat, you know, we had a bed to sleep in, but we were slaves. So fear makes us want to go back. It does not make us want to do what God tells them to do here, and that is move on, move forward. Trusting God, obeying God, believing that he could actually resurrect dead things and dead relationships and dead opportunities, move forward. God tells them. Okay, so now we're going back to Acts 1. This story is a story that they memorized as children. These disciples knew the story of the Red Sea through thick and thin. They, they, they could say it in their sleep. And here they are against a different kind of Red Sea. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were, and now they list all the 11 disciples, not 12, because Judas isn't there. So he lists the omission. It's anybody there would just see this physical hole. The treasurer, Judas, like, of course, he's, he's, a, he's a crook. I don't know why Jesus made him the treasurer, but he was. He, he was not there. He was gone. He had committed suicide. Does it get any worse than this? Then they all joined together. Here's what they do about it. They didn't know what to do, so they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In other words, what they do is they get together in a missional community and they just start praying. They don't know what they're, they, they know they have a mission, but they don't know how to accomplish it, and they don't know what God is going to do to get them ready to accomplish it, and so they just start praying. I invite Maria up. Maria is our groups coordinator here, and I'm just going to have her share a little bit about missional communities and how they look here because essentially they are our, our intention to try to imitate the lifestyle that the disciples decide they had to start living because they started hitting one wall after another and without each other and without a devotion to constant prayer together they did not know how to meet those demands so let's welcome maria please Hi, church. So here at um, Surprise Church, we do groups a little differently. Um, we don't really do traditional Bible studies, um, as some of you might be a little bit more familiar with. Um, and the reason for that, well, there's multiple, and Matt only gave me two minutes today to speak. So, um, One minute and 45 seconds. Okay, so I have to talk fast. And I can't go into all the details for that. Um, but if you come Wednesday night, um, this Wednesday... At 6.30, we are actually going to get missional communities going here at Surprise Church. So if you like what you hear in the next like minute and 15 seconds, um, I want to encourage you to come this Wednesday and learn a little bit more about missional communities and why we are so excited to get them going here at Surprise Church. But basically... Uh, what they are is they're just a group of people who decide that they want to do life on mission. They're maybe a little bit kind of bored with just, I don't know, traditional living for themselves. And um, maybe they're, they're lonely. We live in a very individualistic society where... Um, you know, I think the enemy, too, Satan kind of wants us to feel isolated and alone from each other. I think that's one of... Um, Satan's number one tactics is to, to isolate us from each other. Um, he doesn't want us to live in community with each other because he knows that if we get together, we're dangerous um, for the gospel, and that's when big things start happening. And so he's going to do everything he can in his power to isolate us. And so we really want to um, acknowledge that and take a stand for that and say, when we get together for the kingdom of God to advance the gospel, big things are going to happen. And so we're going to acknowledge that, and we're going to start getting together, and we're going to start brainstorming um, for, for the city of Bismarck. And we're going to start thinking, what are, what are 
some, some needs in our community? And how can we impact the community of Bismarck Mandan for the gospel um, in tangible ways? So we're going to declare the gospel and we're going to demonstrate the gospel in real, in real tangible ways. And we're going to do that together as a family because that's who we are, because we are sons and daughters of the king. And so we are, we're not going to use the family as some fluffy word. We, we really are, we really are sons of daughters, so that makes us brothers and sisters. And so how do we act like a family? What does that mean? What does that look like? How can we serve each other as a family? Um, and so we're going to talk about that. And we're going to live that out. Like, we're actually going to, to live that out. And we're going to talk about what does that look like. And part of that includes maybe having some meals together. We're going to get together this Wednesday night and share a meal together around the table. Because that is, um, we believe that that's, that's holy and sacred. Um, beautiful things happen when we come together and just share a meal together and get to know one another. And um, share stories, hear, hear each other's stories and get to know, you know, know who, we, who, who are you? And, and, and we want to do that. So um, we are, so a missional community, its definition is a family of servant missionaries sent out. And sent is a key word. God is ascending God. He sent his son. Um, he sent his disciples and he wants to send us. And so we are sent out as disciples who make disciples. We want to become a disciple of Jesus, and we also want to disciple others. So we want to grow as a disciple, and we want to learn how to disciple others. And that takes a little bit of training. And so um, we're going to come Wednesday, and we're going to get a little bit of training on how to, how to disciple others. And this Wednesday is just a start. So come this Wednesday, and um, this Wednesday is just the beginning. It's not going to be a one-time thing, just so you know. We're going to start this Wednesday, but we're going to kind of continue on. Every other Wednesday, we're going to meet in each other's homes. We're going to share a meal together around a table. We're going to get to know each other. We're going to listen to each other's stories. We're going to learn what it looks like to be a disciple who disciples others. We're going to become a family um, who takes care of each other um, in the body of Christ, and we're going to grow as a community. We're going to make a difference in Bismarck Mandan, and I'm so excited to start this. I'm going to cry. So here you go. Thank you, Maria, very, very much. Um, that was like three minutes, and so you owe me big time. I'm going to take it out of your paycheck, which is something you can say to a volunteer, and they laugh. <laughs> So uh, I really hope you check it out. Uh, we have a Facebook event on our Facebook page. If you want to learn a little bit more, you can also send us an email if you'd like directions. It's just at my house. We're going we're gonna to just hang out, and it's got a lot of interest so far. It's going to be a crowded, fun. We, we're going to have a party. It's just going to be a party. And so most of missional communities is throwing parties that God invites the world to, and that's how Jesus reached most of the people he reached. Outside of the big crowd events, they were just parties. And so we want to teach people how to throw parties well for the gospel. Uh, so, the, so back in Acts chapter 1, they're praying together. This, this missional community who has a mission from God as a group. That's the definition of a missional community. First, you're not just there because you're the same age or you like each other's hair or you, you all have the same interest in ska music. Um, but it's, it's actually we, we have a mission together. That's what bonds us together. And so they start praying about how to get through the, the Judas wall, how to get stuck get past the Red Sea caliber varsity level challenge of the Judas wall, looking deeply inside themselves and seeing a Judas, what are we going to do about this? Here's what happens. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. So because they prayed, and this is not the words in the Greek text that they translate to describe their prayer time here, it isn't like a, a, a table prayer before a meal, thanks for this time together. This was disciplined constant, mission-focused prayer. God, how do we do this? We are going to be on our knees together regularly until you show us how to move forward. And after you show us, we're going to keep doing this because we need you. So this is a powerful gathering of people who are committed to seeking God together. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. 120 was the legal number in a Jewish community that you needed to actually have a church, a congregation. So once you had this 120, uh, legally you could start to kind of appoint elders and, 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 and authorities, and you could kind of start to see yourselves as a church. So this was, that number is rooted in a, in a Hebrew tradition. And Peter said, after they're praying together, and they, he, Peter gets this vision, and oftentimes when, that, when you're with the missional community and, you, and you're praying together, somebody's going to say, I, I feel like I have something to share. I feel like God has put something on, on my heart um, that, that we need to hear. So hear me out. If it's just me, if it's just a bad piece of pizza, that's cool. You can tell me, but I think this is what God wants us to hear. And here's what he says. Brothers and sisters, the scriptures had to be fulfilled 
in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas. He just calls the white elephant out. I mean, that is the most refreshing thing in the world. When you have that person, and Peter is always that guy, who's just not afraid to just point at the thing in the room and say, there it is. We all know why we're struggling. We, we're, our, our friend just committed suicide, and we don't know how to go forward because we see the same weakness in us. I get it. But the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number, and he shared in our ministry. And then he starts quoting scriptures from the Old Testament that, again, they would have known very, very well. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Look at what he's doing. He's taking scriptures that the disciples would have had no idea pointed to the situation of Judas betraying Jesus. And he's saying, this was the plan. It doesn't mean God made Judas sin. It simply means that he knew even centuries ago that he would, and he planned on it. Here's the good news about that for you and for me. Jesus knows that you and me are sinners, and we're going to stay that way. <laughs> he knows that we have bad habits, irritating personality traits, grudges, insecurities, and anxieties. He knows that we're not going to lose all of those things just because we go to church. He actually plans around your and my issues. Isn't that, isn't that cool? Like when you get on your knees in the morning and say, God, help me to have a great day, and thank you that you're going to work through my junk. Isn't that a, a release? We have a God who works through the issues we have. It doesn't mean he wants to leave us that way. I mean, if you're a grumpy person, I assume that God wants you to kind of cheer up a little bit, get some more sleep, you know, take a cold shower, whatever you need to do. Take, take some breath mints and, and do the best you can. I'm not saying he wants to keep you exactly as you are. I'm saying he can work through your issues as they are. Peter says, God planned that Judas would do this. He knew that someone near Jesus would, would do this. And so there's going to be an open vacancy that God gave, now gives us permission to fill. God planned on this failure, and now he, we're, we're learning that he also planned on us to move on. Just like Israel moved on at the Red Sea. He's saying it's time to move forward. Someone else needs to leave. In other words, missional communities, when you gather together with people outside of church, instead of just staring at the back of someone's head, you're actually looking at each other's eyes and seeing the pain and seeing the fear and seeing the worry and saying, you know what? Fill in the blank. This thing fits into God's plan. You're able to look at each other and say, this conflict that you have in your marriage right now, it fits into God's plan. This financial problem you're having, it fits into God's plan. This this physical illness that you're not sure what's causing the pain, you're not sure if it's going to go away, you've been begging God to help you with it, the thing the, the, thing the doctor just said to you uh, scared the life out of you, this, I don't know how and we don't know why, but we are here to remind you every time we get together and pray that this is going to fit into it. I promise you, we promise you that that your issues are not bigger than God's plans. Your issues are not the superstructure that God's plan needs to fit into. His plan is a superstructure that your issues fit into and your challenges fit into. What he's doing is he's making their world as big as God's plan is. And that's what, at our best, what we can do for each other. We live in a world that constantly makes us think that the problems and the insecurities we have, they're going to do us in. And what we need is a people gathered around us saying, God is bigger, and this thing fits into that plan. And that means if this thing does, so does your future. It means that your future fits into this plan too. That's what Peter's doing here. He's simply doing what Christians are supposed to do for each other. Therefore, it is necessary, Peter goes on, to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning with John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. I love that second name especially. Um, uh, these two guys are people who knew Jesus be before he died and were witnesses that uh, hey, hey, this guy is not dead anymore. 
And they were looking for that 12th man, that, 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 that kind of completion number to be in their crew of people who could stand there and say, yep, I saw him too. And so they chose two guys who fit the bill, who kind of followed in the wider circle of disciples and, and said, one of these two, we're just going to pick to be in this elite crew of the 12. Now watch how they make the call. Oh, this is good. Then they pray. The first thing they do, they pray. Okay, missional community, pray. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Jesus left to go to where he belongs. Now watch what they do. They pray. And when you pray, God, should I take this job or that job? Should I go to this college or that college? Should I date this guy or that guy? I hope you don't have too many options, but you get my point, right? Um, now what they do is they cast lots. <laughs> they get their dice out. And the lot fell to Matthias, and so they added to the 11 apostles. This is the least spiritual way of making decisions in the world. They rolled dice <laughs> to replace Judas. It's like, ah, let's throw a dart near whoever it lands on. Sure, bring them in. On one level, I love the freedom here. I just love that. You know what? We're sure God's just going to tell us. We're, you know what? We're so sure. And this is something that God has done in the past, and it was sanctioned in the Old Testament, so they're not like going to Vegas and getting naughty or anything like that. But this is how God has worked in the past. They had confidence in it. But, but just imagine the freedom just involved in just letting God show you. Just, just putting something out there and letting God speak and saying, okay, we're going to assume that you can actually use dice, ancient version of dice, to, to direct us to answer our prayer. A couple things about casting lots. Number one, it was approved in the Old Testament, so they're not doing anything that people that haven't done before. Secondly, God used it before. It worked before, so they assume he's not changed anything. It was a means then of showing their trust in God, like you've done this before, you've worked through this before, so we're going to trust you with this. And here's the big one. They never did it again, ever. This was the last time I did this. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't as if they never threw caution into the wind and just dared to trust God again in the future. It wasn't as though they, they didn't have decisions to make down the road. They had tons of them. And it wasn't as though they had to kind of pick one without knowing with certainty that one or the other was the right way to go. They did. But they had a different process. See, here's the thing. In the next week, we're going to start... The fun is going to start. Acts chapter 2 is, is the chapter where the Holy Spirit is, is poured out. And the Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity, a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's complicated. We'll explain it. But this gift had not yet been given, and so the best that they had is what they had always had. They kind of asked God to kind of work through the rolling of dice and physical objects to kind of direct and guide their path. But when God pours out his Spirit, they never roll the dice again. They have a new way of making decisions. They have an internal navigation system that God gives them. Galatians 4 talks about this navigation system. I'm going to invite the band up. We're going to end with this. Because you are his children, Galatians 4 says, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. In other words, God is implanting a spirit that helps you look up and recognize God as your dad. Instead of some distant, grumpy deity, he is actually planting a program in the hard drive of your heart that recognizes him as an actual loving father. Now, I don't know how you grew up. I don't know what your relationship with your dad was like. I'm not sure if you've had tough authority figures in your life that make it hard to look up and trust a God. But God wants today to give you his spirit so that you look up and say, Dad. So you are no longer a slave when Israel faced a, 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 a challenge, a wall, they looked back and preferred slavery, and God said, move forward. You are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. You're going to inherit everything. So I'm going to end with this. and Just leave this in your mind. Let it echo. God sends and guides us as his children. That's the kind of relationship he wants with you. And, and he does so within now. No dice involved. God wants to lead you through life. He wants you to be a part of a community that does life together and pursues a mission together. 
And he, and he wants you to have such a relationship with him that you just feel like dad is leading you day by day in a community of, of people who love him and love you. Will you stand up and claim that with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we claim right now the invitation you have shared with us through your word to be your kid. Some of us have said I'm a Christian for years and never honestly thought it was real. But when the rubber meets the road and we, when we come smack dab against the wall, we actually need a real God. And if it's possible that you would be our dad, that would be unbelievable. So Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for everyone in this room who hasn't claimed that relationship yet or who has maybe only done so in theory and not in practice, that we would walk out of this place adopted. We would not leave this place orphaned. We would not leave this place in slavery to the fears that can hold us back from your future, the fear that can hold us back and the insecurity that can hold us back from moving on with Christ. Let us leave this place saying we have a dad. We are going to obey him no matter what because he has our best in mind and he is ready and willing to forgive us, to heal us, and guide us through life. If you believe these words, then let's sing them right now.